We're continuing our study of the kingdom of God, uh, looking at different parables in Matthew's gospel that he taught. Uh, Let me give you just a quick insight into what we've covered already. We've looked at the parable of the sower and the soils in Matthew 13. Uh, Then we looked at the parable of the wheat and the tares. Last week's message, a powerful teaching from Jesus about how the evil one sows tares who look like Christians but aren't really Christians in the kingdom of God. And all of us have seen that happen over the years. Uh, I watched the movie Spotlight this weekend, just a tragic tale of the pedophilia scandal in Boston, and I found myself going, there are tares sown in the kingdom. People who say they're Christians, but they're not producing the fruit of Christ and really are following a different gospel than the one I know. So today we take the next parable in the line of the sower and the soils and the wheat and the tares, two small little parables together, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. Out of reverence for the reading of the scripture, if you're now able, would you please stand? This is the word of the Lord. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till all was leavened. That the old leaven then grew to be, be all over the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. As you read these two parables, there are two different possible interpretations. And as I read different interpreters this week, one would take one position, and then the very next one I read would take exactly the opposite position. So what I decided to do was to present to you both interpretations. And then you can make the decision if you choose one or the other, or maybe somehow both of them can be true at the same time. Here's the first interpretation. It's all about the growth of the kingdom. Uh, Jesus starts out saying the seed, like he did with the parable of the wheat and the tares, is the word of the gospel. Um, It is planted in a field in soils, as you will. Uh, This mustard seed, Jesus said, is the smallest of all seeds. Now, spiritual skeptics through the years have tried to entrap Christians by saying, scientists know the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds. But it was in Jesus' day in Jesus' location. There are smaller seeds in other parts of the world, but it's the smallest seed in Palestine in that area of the world when Jesus existed. And and when that seed is planted in the soils, a tree begins to spring up, and slowly but surely it grows. Now, Now notice it's a seed from the outside, the gospel, that comes into the soil and produces a tree. It it has to do with the difference between religion and the Christian faith. Religion's all about rules and relationships. It's what we've got to do to earn God's favor. But the Christian faith is not about rules and regulations. It's about an internal reality, the seed of the gospel invading our hearts and us having a personal relationship with the living God of this universe through Jesus Christ. And then the tree grows and to about a size of eight feet or so. Some trees went 12 feet or larger. And then birds would come and nestle in the branches of that tree. And so the interpretation is that the seed of the gospel is like the kingdom that goes into this world and it slowly but surely produces a huge tree where the birds represent all the nations of the earth and come and dwell in its branches. Then the parable of the leaven is a similar kind of parable where the leaven, which is small, imperceptible, comes into the loaf of bread, and slowly but surely the bread expands and grows and grows until ultimately these three holes could feed almost 100 people. So therefore, it's another evidence of something outside the gospel coming into the loaf, the world, and the loaf expanding and growing to feed lots of people. 
So the interpretation is quite simple, that the kingdom of God started out small with Jesus born in an insignificant stable in Bethlehem, and then he chose 12 fairly insignificant followers called his disciples. Those 12 became 120 in the upper room, and then when the Holy Spirit was poured down upon them, those 120 became 3,000 at Peter's first Pentecost sermon, and then from there, the gospel to this day, 2,000 years later, has spread to most of the nations on the face of the earth. So that's one interpretation. It is the growth of the kingdom of God, starting with the seed of the gospel of the word of God planted into human hearts who then grow and tell others, and eventually now all the world is nestled in the branches of that small mustard seed that's become an eight to 12 foot tree. Okay, that's one interpretation. And some people believe it's as simple as that. But there are people who object to that interpretation. They take a second view and say this has much more to do about the obstacles that face Christians who are trying to advance the kingdom of God. There are many reasons people look at this kind of idea. They, they believe that the parable of the mustard seed is probably closer to that interpretation, but when you get to the leaven, there are some issues that are up in front of us. What are they? Well, first of all, if you look at the whole idea of the continuum of this parable, uh, first of all, that it starts with the parable of the sower and the soils, and each one of those four soils represents human hearts. There's a hard heart where the seed of the gospel just bounces off, and a bird comes and swoops down, and that bird is the devil who takes the seed of the gospel away. So some interpreters say, wait a minute, in the first parable that Jesus chose, the birds weren't good, all the nations of the earth resting in their branches, the bird was the evil one himself. So and you also look at the whole idea of leaven, that gives a whole new perspective on the, oh, let me give you this insight too from Revelation uh, chapter 18, verse 2, I need to tell you this. This verse reads, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. So in God's judgment against Babylon, which is symbolic of all the rottenness in all the nations of the earth, all the immorality that takes place in nations, one of the comparisons is to birds that are in Babylon. So every place in the Bible, it seems like, where birds are mentioned as a part of God's kingdom, it's in a negative context. And then you look at leaven, for example. In the second parable, yeast is always in the Bible looked upon negatively. And there are several different instances of that. Uh, first of all, with the Jewish nation when they had Passover bread that they ate every year at the Passover celebration, they ate what kind of bread? Unleavened bread. Because yeast was seen, especially in Old Testament, what's called typology, symbolism, as sin. So you keep the yeast out of the bread because it's a symbol of sinfulness that the Jews weren't supposed to ingest. And then you look at the Apostle Paul and some of his teachings. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he wrote these words to the Corinthian church, your boasting is not good. Do you not know what a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So he's calling them to humility to get rid of their pride in their lives. And he gives pride and leaven a synonymous understanding. So from Paul's perspective, leaven was not seen as good. It was seen as a sinful quality that was to be kept out of the church. Thirdly, Jesus' constant warnings about the leaven of different people. For example, in Matthew 16, verses 6 through 12 and other places in the New Testament, he says, for example, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of Jesus' day who tried to interpret the Ten Commandments into 613 moral laws that they tried to obey every single day of their lives. Of course, Jesus called them hypocrites. They couldn't do it, nor could you or I. 
But Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What's the sin or the leaven of the Pharisees? It's formalism. It's reducing the faith to mere rules and regulations. It's defining a relationship with God as what you've got to do day in and day out to get his approval. It's performance-based religion, and it's deathly. Some of you came from toxic churches that said God's only going to love you if you do enough to obey him. Now, now you do want to obey God, but it's not because you have to to earn his favor. It's because you want to in response to the gospel. So Jesus said, beware of the Pharisees' leaven. It'll kill your heart. Then he also says, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. Who were the Sadducees? They were religious leaders in Jesus' day who were more liberal in their interpretation of the Torah. And they did not believe in a resurrection from the dead, for example. That's why they were sad, you see. (laughs) You'll never forget it, okay? It's a sick, stupid joke, but you'll never forget it. The Pharisees were legalists. The Sadducees were liberals. And the leaven of the Sadducees is rationalism. It's what's happened in many of the mainline churches in America. What's been introduced is a mere rationalistic faith. And if it can't be explained scientifically, people don't believe it. All I can tell you is the God I believe in is the God of the miraculous. He said so over and over again. Jesus practiced it. And if you have trouble with miracles, then you've got trouble with the opening verse of the Bible, Genesis 1.1, which says, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now, dear friends, if you believe that, you should not have any trouble with any miracle because the God who created this world is quite able to do whatever he wants to do. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees where faith is reduced to liberalism and rationalism and you don't believe in the power of an almighty God who can do all things. He also said, be aware of the Leaven of the Herodians. The Herodians were religious leaders in that day, but their whole deal was to be in cahoots and collude with the Romans so they could stay wealthy. So beware, believers, of the danger of materialism, the danger of worshiping money above all else. Then he also says, beware of the teaching of the scribes. Well, the scribes were religious leaders of that day, who had as their purpose the teaching of God's word. And Jesus said, beware of them. What is their leaven? It's false teaching. Jesus warned about false teachers. Paul warned about false teachers. Peter warned about false teachers. Over and over again, there are people who can creep into the church and teach falsely. And and I warned you last week that here's what you need to listen to from teachers of the word of God. Do they say that you're a sinner? Or do they just give you a feel-good message that all's going to be okay? The biblical message is all of us have sinned and fall far short of the glory of God. Do they teach repentance? Or do they just say try harder? Repentance means you stop what you're doing because you know it hurts the heart of God. Do they teach judgment? That there's the reality of the judgment of God upon sinners. And do they give you the warning about the reality of eternal separation from God if you don't? Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Those are not popular teachings. They don't create national television ministries, but they are the truths of a true teacher of God. And if someone doesn't teach those things, they're a false teacher. That's why Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the scribes. They're not teaching you the truth. And finally, as you look at the place in the parables again, if you look at the parable of the sower and the soils, there are obstacles there. The enemy who takes the seed of the gospel off the hard heart, the second heart, the shallow heart, the mere emotional heart, when they are persecuted because of their belief in the word of God, they flee. The third heart, the deceitfulness of riches, that money will meet the deepest longings of your heart. And also, the worries of this world, the cares of this world, being so busy, you never contemplate the true cross of Christ. Those are obstacles to those three hearts. It's only the fourth heart that bears fruit. And in the parable of the wheat and the tares, the next one, the evil one sows tares right alongside wheat. 
They're really weeds, but they look exactly like the wheat. The one thing that separates them, though, is fruitfulness. The wheat bears fruit. The tear does not. And there's an obstacle in the kingdom because there are people who say they're Christians but don't bear any fruit for God, and they're not any more Christians than the man in the moon. So then the next parable are these two. So it makes sense, doesn't it, that in the parable of the mustard seed, that there are obstacles, the birds and the branches. The birds in the first parable were the, was the evil one. Here we have demonic hordes that stand against the advancement of the kingdom. And in this parable, there's leaven that is a negative element sowed into the loaf of the world that is not good. It's sinful. Jesus said, beware of it. So those are the four reasons a lot of folks say this parable is a lot more talking about the obstacles that exist in the kingdom of heaven. Now, make your choice. Or I think both of them are true to some degree. And you're going to see in a couple of weeks the same thing happening with the parable of the pearl and the parable of the hidden treasure. There are two meanings, and both of them are valid. So if you can dance with me with both interpretations and say both have some truth in understanding the kingdom of God, which is what Jesus is trying to do to help us understand the kingdom of God. Let me give you several insights that I think both of them teach. First of all, don't despise the days of small beginnings. That's a verse from Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. Don't despise the days of small beginnings. I love that idea because Jesus began small. Have you ever thought about the idea that God chose to put his son, his only son, in a smelly stable in an insignificant little city outside of Jerusalem to be the birthplace of the Savior of the world. I don't know about you, but if I'd been in charge, I'd had Jesus born in the halls of the Roman emperor. I'd have his birthplace as Rome, the capital city, so he could always feel like an important Roman citizen. <laughs> but God chose to be birthed in the midst of manure. in the midst of a cattle trough. <laughs> and in this, Jesus chose 12 to follow him. One of them tried to kill him. The other 11, nothing special about them. And yet, those 11, uh, plus other disciples who came in, especially the Apostle Paul, grew to be 120 in the upper room. And then that 120 became 3,000. And then the whole world is touched by them. So, so it was a small beginning, wasn't it? It's a very small beginning, insignificant. I love the story. Uh, it's a legend, but supposedly Jesus died and went to heaven, and the angels came around him and congratulated him for his faithfulness to the cross, the resurrection, the ascension into heaven. And they said, what's next? What happens now? And Jesus said, will, will you see those ragtag disciples down there? Yeah. They're going to take my gospel into the world, and they're going to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, and the kingdom's going to grow until I come back again. And the angels looked at Jesus. They looked down at the disciples, their lack of education, training. They looked back at Jesus. Then they said, what's plan B? And Jesus said, there is no plan B. That's the plan. It was a very small, insignificant beginning that has now a witness in most every nation on the face of this earth. Don't despise small beginnings. Hey, what's your dream in life? What do you want to do to advance the kingdom? Oh, I'm insignificant, you say. I'm sure Rosa Parks was tempted with that idea back in the 1950s when, as a teenager, she sat not in the back of the bus, but in the middle of the bus and refused to move. That small beginning set off a civil rights movement 
that gave equality to a group of people in our nation, long overdue. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. What's your dream? What's your goal? What do you want to accomplish in life? Well, if you want to advance the kingdom, it begins with kingdom desires deeply within you. There is nothing significant that happens on this side of eternity that does not have an accompanying desire and passion within your heart. Cahil Gibran, you know who he is? Very famous writer. When we were in Lebanon several weeks ago, we actually drove through the village where he was birthed and lived. The Gibranian village, they call it. He gave this quote one time. I love it. He said, desire is half of life. Indifference is half of death. It'll kill you. It will. Indifference is half of death. But if you have desire, you can accomplish so much in life. Socrates, the famous philosopher, was one day with a student who said, I want to learn how to be successful in life. Socrates purportedly said, you really want to learn how to be successful in life? The guy said, oh, yes, I do. So they passed by a river. Socrates said, well, get in the water with me. And he took the guy in the water, and he ducked his head underneath the water, and he held it there. And the guy starts struggling, and Socrates won't let him up. He's just about ready to turn blue. And then he pulled him out of the water. And he said, you want to be successful? The guy said, "Uh uh-huh, gasping for air. He said, well, when you want success, as badly as you want your next breath, then you'll get it. What's your desire to advance the kingdom of God? So what if it's a small beginning? Who cares? Secondly, a desire to advance the kingdom starts with the heart. Remember, we've said it several times, but the Christian faith is from the inside out, not the outside in. Every other religion in the world is from the outside in. It's people trying to work hard to please God so that God will then give them blessings. Every single one. You do the comparative world's religion study. The only faith that stands juxtaposed to that idea of working from the outside in to change the heart is the Christian faith, which says, no, that's not our faith. The Christian faith is the only world's religion where people are transformed from the inside out. It's about the mustard seed, the gospel penetrating our hearts and then slowly but surely growing Daily, monthly, yearly, it's like a piece of leaven, imperceptible almost by the human eye, put into a loaf of bread, and the loaf of bread doesn't have a chance. It starts spreading and growing larger and larger every single day, every single month, and every single year. It's the desire of the heart. And when the gospel of grace and the word of God penetrates the heart, you'll never be the same. And if you're serious with a passion and a desire to love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and might, you'll change. I'll never forget the guy who came into my office one time. And he was so depressed. He'd received Jesus several months earlier. And he was so discouraged. He sat down in a chair and he said, I'm just getting nowhere. I'm praying. I'm reading my Bible. I'm trying to serve. I'm trying to love my wife and my kids. I'm doing the best I know how. I know the grace that invaded my heart. I'm really a changed person, but I just don't think I'm getting anywhere. I don't think I'm really growing. Well, I prayed for him and assured him that Philippians 1, 6 passage that he who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it, that God is able to do that kind of thing. We prayed and hugged, and then he left. 
Amazingly, right after he left, my assistant said, I've got a phone call for you. Went back into my office, grabbed it real quickly. It was this guy's wife. And she wanted to say to me, thank you so much for what you've done for my husband. His life is so dramatically different, I can't believe it. I've never felt so loved and so encouraged by him. He's being a dad to my children, and he stopped drinking. You know, maybe Jesus doesn't change water into wine anymore, she said, but I can tell you this much, he's changed his alcohol into money for our kids. And I sat there and just started laughing to myself. Here he is thinking, I'm not getting anywhere. And he can't really see it, nor can you that much. You know why? Because you're living in your own skin. But I bet if you're really serious about loving God and the gospel of grace has penetrated your heart, there will be change. There has to be. And my bet is those who live closest to you are seeing it. Now, it is a progressive holiness. It does not happen overnight. Just like the mustard seed takes time to grow into an 8 to 12 foot tree. Just like the leaven takes time to expand that loaf. But if the kingdom of heaven has entered your heart and there's a deep desire within you, your, your heart is changing. It has to by the power of the gospel. That's what Paul meant in Romans in 1.16 when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can't speak for you. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is my life. It is what I preach breathlessly and with all energy I have. Because Paul then goes on to say, it is the power of God unto salvation. It's what changes human hearts. It's the only hope I know for this world in which we live. When the true gospel enters your heart and you're passionate about it, There will be life change. There has to be. Pablo Casals was a famous cellist, was one of the best in the world. Did you know he practiced every day, even when he was 95 years old? Someone finally went to him and said, Mr. Casals, you're the best in the world. Why are you practicing daily the cello? And he said, well... I think I'm making some progress. <laughs> I think I'm making some progress. If you've invited Jesus to come into your heart and the gospel of grace has really rooted itself deep within you, I think you're making some progress. But it starts in the heart and then manifests itself outwardly with fruit for the glory of of the kingdom of God. So kingdom growth starts in the heart. And third and finally, the kingdom will continue to grow until Jesus returns. Now, first of all, may I remind all of you that Jesus is going to return one day. Now, you may not believe that, but first of all, he said so clearly. In these parables, we see that reality again and again. Last week in the parable of the wheat and the tares, he'll come again, and the angels of heaven who come with him will separate the wheat and the tares. He told us not to try to do it because the roots of the wheat and the tares are so intermingled, we can't start pulling out people whom we think are or aren't Christians. Don't do it, Jesus said. Leave that to my angels, the harvesters, who will do that at the end time. But he said, I'll come back with my angels. So he is coming back one day. But the truth is, uh, until he comes back, this kingdom is going to grow and has grown. Now, you may hear from some people, well, the church is being overcome by Islam. Now, I don't want to deny that Islam is growing. In many cases, Islam is growing by the sword and not by choice. Islam is growing because people are given jobs and payments, and some people are choosing because they want to. But did you know the fastest growing religious segment of people on the face of the earth right now? It's the crazy group of people called evangelical Christians. Now, you need to know evangelical Christians aren't monolithic. They're all stripes and colors of those of us who call that. 
I'm one of them. But for me, what it means is largely an absolute commitment to this word. I, I stand with the word of God interpreting me, not standing over the word of God trying to interpret it. But it also means a desire for all the nations to know Jesus. That group of people empowered by the Holy Spirit are now 600 million strong. They're the fastest growing group in the world. And within a decade or two, most missiologists are predicting that evangelical Christians will become the largest Christian group in the world, surpassing the Catholics. Now, the reason for that is primarily because of the evangelism imperative that evangelical Christians feel. And most of you know I'm impassioned by that. My heart is to preach the gospel among people who've never heard. That's why we have ministries in the Mideast and in Nepal and unreached people's groups. And you just need to know that where the faithful proclamation of the gospel is taking place, there's an explosion of Christians coming to faith. And even in the Mideast right now, when Marilyn and I were in Lebanon, talking with Syrian Muslims, did you know that dozens of them, we had them raise their hands, dozens of them are seeing visions of Jesus. He's appearing in dreams. He's telling them things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and they're believing in him. Which begs me to ask you these final two questions. Does the kingdom live in you? Does Jesus have reign, which is what the kingdom means, in your heart? Is he the master passion of your soul? If so, there are obstacles that you face, <laughs> the devil, <laughs> The world's system of godless values and this body, which you still live in, right? Still has urges and lusts. There's still an obstacle, but he's greater than the obstacle. Does he live in you? And secondly, how are you advancing the kingdom through you? There are two aspects to the kingdom. Christ in you, then flowing through you. Is there anybody you've ever brought to faith in Christ? Anyone? How about your prayer life? Is it praying for the kingdom to expand? Are you crucifying pride and replacing it with humility? That's the kingdom. Are you more of a giver or a getter? Look at your checkbook. It'll show you. When you go into your office place, is there enough evidence about who you are in Christ that others would know about it? In other words, if you were put on trial for your Christian faith, would there be enough evidence to convict you? How are you advancing the kingdom? Caring for people in trafficking, the poor, the needy, the hungry, the oppressed. I'm not sure which interpretation is right. I tend to believe both of them are, but I can assure you of this. Both of them talk about the growth of the kingdom with obstacles, and people who follow Jesus should be a part of that growth. Are you? And it's all for his glory and the advancement of the kingdom of God. Amen and amen. Would you please stand?